Now it's with great pleasure that uh, in place of Mustafa Suleiman, I introduce my uh, colleague, Dr. Dominic King, uh, who will talk to us today about how improved digitization within healthcare can transform care for the better. So thank you, Dominic. Thanks, Kim. Oh, have you got, thank you, thanks, guys. Uh, first off, it's a great honor and pleasure for, um, for us to have you all here. Um, so, I was going to tell you, if I can get the slide deck up. Looks like the previous one. So I was going to use this next 20 minutes to uh, give you my perspectives as a, a clinician now working at a big technology company uh, about the importance I think uh, interoperability and open standards um, have in both um, the lives of clinicians and patients. I wanted to tell you a bit about DeepMind. Uh, we're hosting, we're not here to uh, uh, give you too much, um, uh, uh, feed you too much uh, lengthy information about all the work we're doing, but I really want to give you a sense of some of the projects we're working on and also talk to you about what we think is the exciting opportunities for machine learning and healthcare in the future. So, I uh, was just a simple jobbing NHS clinician. Uh, I qualified in 2003. Um, I have never coded, very uninterested in technology until about 2007 when the iPhone came out. But like most clinicians, I became incredibly kind of frustrated about the conditions in which we found ourselves working in. So, you know, the, the doctor's office, this isn't taken 10 years ago, this is taken a year ago. Um, you know, folders all over the place, notes all over the place. Um, the thing that I became most annoyed about was pages. So when I started uh, in 2003 as a house officer in Manchester, it was really exciting to get a pager. We were all like very, uh, thought we were cool having a pager. Uh, that kind of wore off very quickly. And by 2014 or 15, it was actually beyond a joke. Um, I, this, to me, I mean, I b subsequently became a kind of academic surgeon with uh, the majority of my research interests in patient safety and digital health. This, to me, sums up like everything that is wrong, and this is not an NHS problem. If you go to the major US medical centers that we all look up to, Stanford, Mayo Clinic, this is, happens in these places exactly as it happens at the big teaching hospitals in London or the DGHs um, outside which is every nurse and doctor is walking around with a list of jobs that they need to do that day. Now, when you consider how complex healthcare is, this is just a kind of micro view of the world. You have one doctor, one nurse, a porter, uh, a hospital manager or a bed manager looking after many patients, multiple comorbidities. Um, there is a sequence of actions that need to happen across the hospital or the ward or the uh, system that if, those, that sequence of events go, happens in the right order, patients are going to do well. What happens actually is this rarely, if ever, happens because of those paper lists, pages, etc. Now, digital systems exist to try and help smooth those issues out, but you know, in this room we have dozens uh, of uh, providers of amazing IT systems, but unfortunately this is kind of what the desktop looks like if you're a clinician in clinic. So, we were down at a hospital a few weeks ago in colorectal clinic where I used to spend a lot of my time. Um, and the, the consultant said, oh, I have to have five different systems open to see a patient. So I need to be able to look at endoscopies. I need to look at blood tests. I need to send orders. This is just an incredibly challenging, difficult place to work if you're facing that level of complexity. Now, I recommend you never go to Ikea on a Saturday, but I found myself at Ikea on a Saturday a few weeks ago. And look, the world has changed a lot since 2007. Not only did in 2007 I think, actually, technology is pretty cool and there's amazing things that can happen from it. Like, we are now, Ikea are now producing uh, tables with charging facilities for your smartphone because every single one of you sleeps next to a smartphone. Um, or at least uh, when I saw the last figures, over 90% of the UK population. So in about 2008, 2009, I got very interested in the role of digital health and the idea that the smartphones that I saw every doctor and nurse now carrying could have a really big impact on how we deliver healthcare. 
So we did a survey, which, uh, which I think was probably the first uh, major uh, uh, survey of its kind of doctors and nurses across uh, London. This is uh, late 2014 numbers, um, and we published this uh, last year in BMJ Innovations. 99.8% of doctors have a smartphone. I still haven't found the uh, couple that don't. This was a survey of 6,000 uh, doctors and nurses. 98% of nurses had a smartphone. And the vast majority of these doctors and nurses are using their smartphone every day at work. But using things like WhatsApp. So for those of you, I'm sure you do all know because uh, you're in the business of knowing, but every junior doc, well, mostly uh, close to every junior doctor in London is currently using WhatsApp to communicate amongst their teams because that represents to them the best hack around or work around of the current systems and disparate systems that they have to use. So we published a paper, uh, I think it was in the American Journal of Surgery, again last year, um, which showed actually this is like incredibly helpful, vastly better than pages, but surely the creative wit and ingenuity of the people in this room can come up with more you know, bespoke systems than WhatsApp uh, to better manage clinical activity. And if life's challenging or difficult for uh, clinicians, doctors and nurses, it is you know, really challenging for patients. So, I, I mean, I've been relatively lucky in my life that I've never spent a night in hospital, a few broken minor bones. You know, um, in November of last year, or year, uh, sorry, November of uh, 2015, um, me and my wife had a premature son, um, and we were in hospital for about six weeks, had multiple outpatient appointments following that. Uh, our son is very well and healthy now. But I really got the sense for the first time of the pain and challenge that you have if you're on the other side of uh, uh, the, the consulting table. So if life is difficult for clinicians, it's really challenging for patients and their families too. So, I mean, I was inspired a few years ago, this is uh, in my previous position, Imperial, to you know, think about how we could use the smartphone as a, as a, a way of delivering, you know, platforms, solutions that could help clinicians and patients um, access services uh, and, and, and manage their health better. So we worked in a stream of applications together. So, um, so I, I have huge enthusiasm for uh, digital systems. I think they're the things that could make our hospitals safer and more effective in these very challenging times. And I really do think that the smartphone that every single uh, one of us is carrying in this audience is the route through what, which much of uh, the benefits we can derive in the next few years will happen. So moving on now to DeepMind, um, and just, I, I really, we are an artificial intelligence company, and I just want to give you a sense of why we're focusing so much on this kind of digital health aspect of things for the time being. So DeepMind is entirely based in this building, on two floors of this building, and we're split broadly into a research team and an applied team. Uh, the research team has a, a grand mission of creating what's called general artificial intelligence. And this is the idea of creating algorithms that can be applied across a wide variety of domains. So the same algorithm can be applied to a range of different um, uh, issues or conditions. Um, we then have an applied team, which myself, Kian, and uh, a number of other people in the audience sit in, which is how can we think about applying these algorithms in the real world and with a very strong push in this last sentence for you know, t tackling tough social problems, for you know, trying to make a, a valuable and a good impact in the world. Now, in terms of the research, you know, the research that comes out of DeepMind is just unbelievable. Uh, I, as I mentioned before, I'm uh, probably the least technical person in DeepMind. Just you know, uh, uh, incredible progress in the development of these general purpose algorithms. So, you know, within two years, three Nature papers for the scientists and academics in the audience. You know, this is this is an incredible achievement. Um, starting first with Atari games, which I'll show you a video of uh, shortly. Moving on to Go, the you know game considered to probably be the most challenging complex game ever invented. Uh, so the research effort is going tremendously well. In terms of our applied work, a lot of our work until recently, until a year ago, was uh, you know, largely internal facing with different Google products and services. And we announced an example of this project, you know, a, a success uh, a few months ago, which was applying DeepMind algorithms across Google's vast uh, compute infrastructure. So 
you know, Google uh, energy requirements to keep the internet running are, as you'd imagine, very substantial. And this is already an incredibly well-optimized system with some of the you know, cleverest engineers and uh, uh, energy experts in the world making sure that this system is, is honed as, as well as and effectively as possible. Using DeepMind algorithms, the cooling costs of those servers were reduced by 40%, which is just you know, a, a, a ridiculously big shift in performance in an already well-optimized system. How, how does a DeepMind algorithm work? So the, you know, there's lots of different types of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, but you know, two of the areas that we've become very expert in is in uh, deep learning of using neural networks and also reinforcement learning. And I just want to spend a little bit of time describing this because this will hopefully explain to you why it's so important for those, you know, there's lots of people that will be thinking about the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning and maybe some of the products they're building, why it's so important to kind of understand why this is so difficult at the moment in the current health environment. So in reinforcement learning frameworks, you have an agent that could be uh, someone looking at YouTube, but it could be an autonomous vehicle, it could be a doctor taking a prescribing decision, who has a goal, and that goal is set. Um, they exist in an environment in which it's possible to observe the impact of different actions on that environment. And effectively, it's trial and error. So you just, the system keeps learning and improving and getting better and better. So the DQN algorithm that was used in the first Nature paper, um, this video demonstrates exactly uh, how a reinforcement learning framework works. So we're starting off, the agent is told the goal, which is to maximize the arcade score. At the beginning, it's pretty useless. After a couple of hundred games, it's about as good as most of us, um, which is, you know, it's learning that it's slowly breaking the wall down. The points are going up. Um, and then the engineers and the researchers describe, you know, we left this overnight and came back, and wow, this happened. After 500 games, it identifies this remarkable kind of um, route to success, which is effectively creating a tunnel up the side and doing the least effort uh, with the maximum reward. So if you then compare that, you know, a reinforcement learning framework, if you kind of think about it in healthcare, the actions are moderated through pages, through WhatsApp, through uh, conversations in the corridor. Um, the observations we make are on paper charts at the end of the bed or on paper notes or in 200 different systems uh, uh, that the hospital uses. So the idea that you could you know, put in DeepMind or any organization's <laughs> algorithm into this relatively chaotic environment um, is, is actually really challenging to see. Um, so the, the majority of our efforts are really around doing what lots of you in this room are trying to do, which is get people like Sarah off pages and paper lists. This is you know, exactly what happened 13 years ago when I qualified. I was given a pager, and I had a list of patients which had a list of jobs in the fourth column. Moving that away to you know, what we feel it should be clinically-led mobile-first solutions. So you know, we would think of the smartphone as being central to that, the ability to both deliver interventions, to send nudges, prompts, um, as well as measuring or collecting information about the patient that will be relevant and could at some point in the future support uh, these algorithms. So that's why we're spending so much time uh, building a clinician-facing platform. We do not see this as some all-encompassing uh, platform. Uh, that's why we are so keen to support the effort that's going on here. We see this as one of many tools that a clinician or a patient uh, may have all of which are supporting the move towards um, uh, improving kind of the digital record. So just to give you a sense of what we're doing with streams, um, we've taken, we decided to focus on a condition that, to be fair, lots of people don't know about. But if you're a clinician or a patient who's had acute kidney injury, you do know about it. Because it affects one in five, one in four hospital inpatients. It leads to about 40,000 deaths a year in the UK. Uh, and a cost of about a billion pounds plus to the system. Um, the first thing we did, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at what areas we could or should be working in um, before focusing on acute kidney injury. 
And what we really wanted to do was understand one pathway. You enter the average hospital, there are eight or 900 different pathways, and we wanted to understand and make an impact in one of those pathways. So our designers, the clinicians and the team of which, you know, there's four full-time clinicians, uh, half a dozen part-time advisors, 40 or 50 nurses and doctors who we consult with uh, uh, about each stage of our project. We went in, we defined with the team what the pathway was. We recognized, like you all would, that we want to avoid all this nasty red bit or the you know, life-threatening complications of acute kidney injury. And we identified where we as a technology company could have uh, an impact, you know, uh, uh, and realize some benefit in the short to medium term. And that was really actually at this point here, tiny bit of the pathway, which is, um, Every doctor and nurse does their morning rounds, does lots of blood tests, and then at some point in the evening or afternoon, they'll go back to the system and look at lots of blood tests and go, oh dear, this patient's got an acute kidney injury, this patient's white cell counts up, this patient's got liver dysfunction, and then a whole flurry of activity will happen. And you know, I think a lot of us realize that that's actually not the way we should be practicing, that if a problem's identified, it should be alerted to the right person at the right time, and a response uh, mediated much sooner. So um, our aim is, was ultimately we wanted to try and improve this pathway in a small way if we could, working with the nephrology team. Uh, and that led to the Streams AKI project at the Royal Free Hospital. So this is now a live product, uh, which uh, started at the beginning of this year. You log in to Streams using your Royal Free username and password. Uh, and you're presented with a list of patients who have an acute kidney injury. And if you have the handset and you're walking around the raw free as the nephrologist on call, you will get alerts pinged to you every time an acute injury alert is generated. This is, on average, at least 10 alerts a day. So I can go into the patient's alert. Uh, I should say 10 meaningful alerts a day, a number of dozen alerts that do not need to be actioned for various reasons. And that's why having this uh, you know, wider context is so important. So I can go in, look at the creatinine level. Is this acute? Is this chronic? What time period has this happened over? Um, I'm able to also look at other reasons why uh, a patient may have an acute kidney injury, such as sepsis. So I can look at a blood test like CRP. Um, and we're also bringing information for, such as previous diagnostic codes in. So this is why it's so important to bring these systems together. You know, it is of interest to me whether a patient has had a renal transplant or a kidney stone or has one kidney, which is why this data has been so important to the nephrologists that have built this service with us. And look, we, we, I would much prefer to be standing here sitting with the peer-reviewed paper, which we will have, and that may show positive, it may show negative impact. But you know, I've heard a few times today talking about no surprises. You know, we are taking it very seriously that we have to inform uh, the people, the patients that are using the hospitals we are working with. So one of the you know things that you know we feel necessary to do is start telling the story of actually the positive impact of some of the work we're doing. So this st story featured prominently in the Evening Standard earlier this week. Um, this lady um, who was happy to share information and a picture. Uh, had an emergency cesarean section, developed uh, sepsis, unfortunately, afterwards, which is a known uh, problem after uh, a cesarean section. She de developed an acute kidney injury as a consequence of that. And before the, the team that was looking after realized she had an acute kidney injury, there was a consultant nephrologist there by her bedside managing her care. So acute kidney injury alerts could be any number of other alerts uh, following that. So. Um, we think that massive progress and impact can uh, take place way before we start talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Although, you know, we are very excited and confident these algorithms can have a substantial impact in healthcare too, but we see that as a more long-term uh, uh, goal, although there are some areas where it's possible to see some benefit now. Newspapers, medical journals, uh, Meetups, conferences are full of exciting uh, aspirations about artificial intelligence. Uh, we share many of those, but we also um, have the benefit of you know, being arguably the leading artificial intelligence group in the whole world. 
and actually knowing what is and is not possible at this time point. Um, and the idea, as I said, that you can use these algorithms uh, within the environment of pages and paper is, is a really challenging concept for us. So there are not just deep mind interest in artificial intelligence and healthcare. There are dozens, some of which are in this room, dozens of organizations. You know, we are in an amazing uh, place in London and the wider UK at the moment, uh, which is flourishing in AI research, some of the world's best universities, uh, UCL, Oxford, with uh, some of the most prestigious programs. We're able to recruit the world's best AI researchers to DeepMind. So there is a, a, a huge potential for AI research more widely, but in healthcare and the NHS in the UK. But we totally respect that it needs to be done sensibly and safely, and which, which is why we're spending so much time and effort trying to do that. But you know, AI machine learning could have a role in all kinds of areas, from diagnostics to things like patient prioritization, discharge planning, preventing readmission, and many of you in, the, in this room may be working on those. So um, I just you know, want to reconfirm, uh, and I know, I know that for some people it does cause some confusion that uh, you know, DeepMind is an artificial intelligence group not doing AI. We are interested in AI. Um, but as uh, you know, it says on our partner's websites, um, you know, we're, we're trying to say to the public and patients using the hospitals we're working with, um, DeepMind, uh, sorry, this partnership does not use artificial intelligence technology and the agreement between trust and DeepMind does not allow the use of artificial intelligence. And that is for the five-year partnerships that we have with these trusts. So if you also, uh, sorry, look at what we say on uh, the uh, DeepMind website, we think there's huge potential for AI to help clinicians and patients, but the reality is that current IT infrastructure does not really make this innovation possible. We want to help patients anywhere we can. Working with hospital trust to fix more fundamental problems means we can have more immediate impact and lay the foundations for more advanced uh, technology in due course. And that's really what we're trying to do. And um, we're interested in AI ultimately. There's lots of you are interested at this earlier stage. And I think you know, if you put the collective ingenuity and resources of everyone in this room together, we would make dramatic changes without any AI being used. And at some point in the future, it may be helpful, it may not, we have to prove that. But, you know, the signs are very positive. So we, you know, we're focused at the moment in, uh, in a couple of AI research projects. Um, one with Moorfields Eye Hospital, the other with UCLH looking at radiotherapy uh, planning. But most of our focus has been on the Moorfields project. Uh, we will be in a position to publish the results of uh, this relatively soon. But you know, really exciting, uh, I can't say anything more than really exciting, tremendous um, uh, re uh, results I think will be delivered from a clinically led project from the Moorfields team that came here and said we have a problem with triaging and dealing with all these scans that are being done by every high street optician. Is there any role for machine learning? Uh, yes, possibly. And we undertook you know, a lengthy uh, and extensive research project as I said, the results, results will hopefully go out in the next couple of months and hopefully demonstrate positive impact to you. Um, but you know, we, just to summarize and reiterate again, great potential for AI, but there's much more potential in the near and medium term from all the work everyone is doing here, as long as it all links up together and is interoperable and supports clinicians and patients. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, very happy, you know, there's a huge amount of information on our uh, DeepMind uh, website, uh, including all our contracts with partners. Uh, so we're very keen on being open and transparent, but my email address is there, dominicking at deepmind.com. I'd be incredibly happy uh, to hear from any of you if you have any questions. Thank you very much.